I'm Sandy Pensinger for Birds of the Bay. This show is sponsored by the Santa Cruz Bird Club. The Santa Cruz Bird Club sponsors birding walks and talks, bringing together like-minded people. Find out more at santacruzbirdclub.org. In this episode, I'll be interviewing Sophie Webb. Sophie is an artist, scientific illustrator, author, ornithologist, and field biologist. She has done birding on a level that most of us would only dream of. Her accomplishments include studying and painting birds from the Antarctic to the Arctic, from studying flammulated owls in New Mexico, mockingbirds in Galapagos, bowerbirds in Australia, shorebirds in Alaska, and seabird surveys in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, doing research in the Gulf of Alaska, Bering, and Chukchi Seas. She has traveled extensively. In Mexico and Northern Central America, she worked on the illustration plates for the milestone book, A Guide to the Birds of Mexico and Northern Central America. It was published in 1995. The guide details approximately 1,070 species. She is an award-winning children's book author. She has been to the Antarctic eight times as a research assistant studying Adelie penguins and as a recipient of a National Science Foundation Antarctic Artist and Writers Grant, and lastly, as a tour guide. Sophie currently lives in Felton, California. We'll be talking to her today. So today we're going to chat with Sophie Webb about her life with birds, and we're going to travel vicariously with her through the in the pandemic um so welcome sophie how are you today i'm fine thank you great so um tell us a little bit about growing up on the east coast with the webb family well i have um two brothers and um, I had a mother who was very uh, involved in art. Uh, she was a sculptor, quite well known. And she was very, um, she was a great mother in terms of uh, making us really interested in, um, in just in the world. Uh, I went out to the beach a lot with her sort of to go beach combing and uh, she really encouraged all of us to pursue our interests so we have all ended up uh, become being involved in the arts in one way or another so one of my brothers is a photographer um, I'm uh, an, a wildlife artist and biologist and my other brother is a a painter who teaches at Pratt School of Design. Yeah, and your dad? And my dad was, he had a small publishing company for a while, and then he was an editor for a while. All right. Um, so in your life back there, uh, you studied at Boston University. What fields of study did you pursue and how did you decide on what to focus on? So just to back up a little bit, ever since I was a little kid, I always was crazy about animals and wildlife. And so part of my mom, my mother's encouraging uh, each of our kids' interests, I went to Audubon camp every summer uh, it was a day camp, and I would go to that every summer. And um, it was, we did all different kinds of kinds of things. So it wasn't just oriented towards birds, but birds were definitely a part of uh, Audubon camp. And um, that was a really important. Um, it was really important for me, um, in retrospect, that I had that opportunity to go and just learn about nature as a little junior naturalist. Um, so when I started college, I'd actually taken a couple of years off. I also was a kid who got uh, quite horse crazy. Um, so I'd taken off two years to uh, work with horses. But 
started college uh, at first, I went to Skidmore College for a year, started off as an art student there, didn't really like it there, and then transferred to Boston University into their School of Fine Arts. And so I spent my um, freshman and sophomore years as an art student, um, but always wanted to take some biology classes. At the same time, I was also doing volunteer work at the New England Aquarium, oh. uh, their curatorial department. And that was working with harbor seals, penguins, uh, sea otters, beavers, and, uh, and not uh, river otters, not sea otters. Um, and um, so I um, decided that I needed to take some biology courses. So I took a intro biology course during a summer and decided at one point I decided that I could could teach myself the art part, but couldn't necessarily teach myself biology, which in retrospect, I'm not really 100% sure is, is correct, but, but that was my thinking at the time. So I ended up transferring within the university into their biology program. Wow. Uh, that <clears throat> sounds like a, you had a variety of experience and kind of got a good base for your next step. Um, you were uh, doing research, and through that process, you authored, co-authored, and illustrated several books which have won awards. Among them are A Guide to the Birds of Mexico and Northern Central America, My Season with Penguins, Looking for Seabirds, and Far from Shore. That's quite, quite an accomplishment. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your books? Um, so after I graduated from college, uh, I was lucky I did not have a lot of student loans. So I was able to kind of um, pursue my interests. And so I worked on a lot of different biology field jobs. And one of those field jobs uh, took me out to Point Reyes Bird Observatory, which is where I met my ex-husband Steve Howell who is also the co-author of A Guide to the Birds of Mexico and Northern Central America. So um, we ended up at one point he had spent quite a bit of time uh, in Mexico and had traveled all the way down through Central America and decided that he would like to do a guide and he asked me if I wanted to uh, participate in that. And I said, yes, I figured it was going to take maybe about two years to do it or three years. And then I was kind of planning on going to graduate school. Um, and as it turned out, 10 years later, the book finally came out. So with that book, we spent vast amounts of time traveling throughout Mexico and Central America. Uh, we, at the time we lived uh, at Point Reyes Bird Observatory, they had a little cabin there that we stayed in and we could stay in for free and um, act as caretakers while we weren't traveling. And um, we would sort of decide on either particular areas in Mexico or particular groups of birds or particular seasons where maybe there would be something like uh, lots of juveniles coming out um, that, uh, so we would, we would uh, focus our trips around those um, various things. And each of the trips would be anywhere from two months to five months long. And we would, you know, drive around in our little VW rabbit. And um, then, the other, the other, when we when we came back to the U.S., I spent part of the time painting in California, and then I also spent quite a lot of time uh, at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. And um, the people at the American Museum were incredibly generous. We had keys to the ornithology department. We could work there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, it, it was really a really great experience to be able to spend so much time there. So we'd spend a couple of times we spent five or six months living in New York while we were working uh, working on 
I was working on illustrations and Steve was just gathering data on specimens at the museum. So I, I, I can only imagine what that must be like, You're just um, seeing birds, the, the skins of birds that are rare species or extinct species. What was it like the first time you touched or held a skin of a bird that was ex that's now extinct? Well, that you didn't really hold them because they're so rare, right? They only have a certain number of uh, of, of uh, specimens, but it certainly was pretty exciting to actually see them, like ivy-billed woodpeckers, and then there's a another uh, big woodpecker which is probably extinct, um, has hasn't been seen for for many many years, called the imperial woodpecker, which is endemic to Mexico. Um, yeah, it was pretty, it was thrilling. Yeah, I felt very fortunate that I got to, you know, see some of those things, although I would, of course, prefer to have seen them alive, but, but felt fortunate that I could, could see them at least, at least that way. What, what things did you look at on the specimens that you can't see when you see a bird in, in its natural environment? What, what, what were you looking for? Well, you have to remember when we started working on this field guide, it was long before digital photography. So getting, having, right now you can, you know, you can go on the internet and you can find really great photos of many, many species that are, you know, difficult, difficult to see, difficult to see well, or not very well known. So, um, it was really, really important to, to look at the specimens, particularly for, well, you can get a lot of, a lot of fine feather detail. Um, you know, obviously the, the specimens aren't great for, you know, uh, getting posture and that kind of thing, but a lot of them also had really good um, information on the tags. So they might have information about soft part colors. So that would be like the color of the eye ring, the color of the eyes, the color of the legs, which are all things that um, with specimens, you know, you, you can't see or, um, you know, you only get a glimpse of one when you're out birding, birding, um, you might not, might not see that all that well. So those are sort of the, and then there's all different kinds of things like, you know, you can measure wings, you can also look at a whole, whole tray, of a say of a subspecies of something and get a good idea of the the overall you know look if they have like a slightly different um, color than a different subspecies and you know just there are just a lot of things that, things that um, you can learn from uh, those museum specimens. All right. <clears throat> so what attracted you to Santa Cruz in the Monterey Bay area? So when I decided uh, to move, I really I moved down here for a couple of different reasons. One is I already knew people down here, down in the air, in this area, so I didn't really want to move someplace where I didn't know anybody. And another big draw was uh, Monterey Bay because at that time. I had sort of shifted away, a little bit away from uh, being as involved with uh, tropical birds to being really interested in seabirds. And Monterey Bay is a fabulous place for seabirds. It's one of the best places in the world for seabirds. All right. So you've logged a lot of miles on NOAA uh, research cruises and other, sh other vessels. Um, Tell us a little bit about what you were doing out there. Measure, were you measuring biodiversity in uh, deep water environments? And if you're measuring a lot of the what's under the water, do the seabirds help you find those underwater um, treasures <laughs> that are under there? So, so I worked on a couple of different types of research cruises. So 
a lot of the cruises that I worked on in California, and also when I worked up in Alaska, with, with some exceptions, the, the cruises were mostly um, oceanographic and fisheries oriented cruises. And I just went on, on them as a, an ancillary project was to, to count, was to count birds, um, you know, to census the seabirds. And then basically what end, ended up happening with, at least with some of the data, it ended up being part of a collaborative project between the fisheries biologists or, and oceanographers and um, the people I was working for, whether it was Point Reyes Bird Observatory or the Fairlawn Institute. Um, and they would uh, collaborate on. So, so I was just, when the ship was moving over five knots, I was just up on the top of the ship censusing seabirds. And so the way, um, the type of censusing that I did of seabirds was is called a strip transect. And so that's, I would count all the birds on one side of the ship, only on one side of the ship, out to 300 meters. And depending on the uh, program that I was using, sometimes that, those would be binned into 100, 200, and 300 meter uh, section zones. And sometimes it was just, you know, you know one out, out to 300 um, and um, and then that data I would have a you know some kind of a computer with me and I would just enter that data uh, directly into the computer and various programs were some are slightly different some of them had um, you know different co different behavioral codes so you know the, the basic things I would be recording would be you know whether the birds were associated with other species so if they were in some kind of mixed flock whether they were feeding whether resting whether they're flying what direction they're flying in and you know those those kinds of things well great so you've you've told me stories um because we we have uh, lots of interactions outside of birds um <clears throat> about finding songbirds at sea what unexpected non-seabird species have you found while you're out on the water that you can remember off the top of your head? Well, one of the things that's that, that's always I always think is kind of kind of fun to think about. Though there there've been lots of different things. Like I've we've had lark sparrows out there, and we get you know I get um I've had uh, long-eared owl and short-eared owl. We had a burrowing owl when we were off of Mexico. So owls are obviously one spe one group that one doesn't necessarily think of as being, you know, really far offshore. Um, you know, peregrines are really, really long distance migrants, but even seeing a peregrine when you're 1,500 not miles out at sea is always kind of, always kind of surprise. And we would, uh, fairly frequently when we were in the sort of uh, central part of the Pacific, we would get a uh, young peregrine uh, hanging out on the ship and they'd hang out for, you know, maybe a week or two weeks and they would use the ship as their, as their perch and they would, you know, you, we would be in an area where it seemed like there weren't any birds around at all and they would zoom out, sort of almost zoom out of sight and then they would come back and they would have a storm petrel. Um, and uh, wow. proceed to dismember it from the on, on top of one of the masts on the ship. Um, and uh, and I always like like to like to think of them um, sort of ship hopping. We had one uh, young peregrine that had been with us for maybe a week or ten days, and then it it saw a cargo ship, you know, way off on the horizon, and it just made a beeline for that. And then I figured that was its, you know, for the next couple of weeks, that was going to be its next new home. So that was always, that kind of thing was always kind of fun. Another time, uh, a species that, um, you know, is, is that winters throughout the uh, Pacific on Pacific Islands is a Pacific Golden Plover, and we had a Pacific Golden Plover that that landed on the ship and ended up staying with us for about uh, two weeks. Um, and I discovered that it really liked to uh, eat the 
krill that we had. We had some frozen krill that we had for uh, aquarium fish because we would also uh, catch a few aquarium fish for the birch aquarium. And um, I had noticed that whenever they sprayed the front deck to clean it off, the plumber would run around because it would see the little water puddles that were left. And so I started throwing thawing some of the krill and throwing it out into these little water puddles and it started eating that and then I switched it over to squid um, and that was quite that was quite fun and then eventually it it you know after a couple of weeks it it too ended up flying off and I I hope to some uh, Pacific Island to spend the winter. Yeah you told me about uh, some warblers I think that you fed um, uh, mealworms Yes, so so um, particularly uh, during the spring rockfish cruise and also uh, the fall cow coffee cruise off of here, um, we would get warblers uh, on migration that would come and land on the ship. Often on these days when it you have this sort of uh, high overcast, but you can't see that far. So they, I think they get kind of, they can see the ship, but they can't see the land. So they end up landing on the ship. And uh, I would uh, try and remember to bring dehydrated mealworms with me and rehydrate those and, and give that to them so that hopefully I could keep them alive until we were close enough to land or we could see land, the fog had lifted and they could see land and I could let them go. I have to admit that quite a lot of them ended up dying, but but you know, I tried. <laughs> yeah, did the best you could. Right. So, um, what are some of your favorite birding conservation organizations, and uh, how did you decide to support them? Well, I of course like Oikonos Ecosystem Knowledge because that's an organization that. Um, I helped found many, many years ago. I'm, I used to be on the board. I'm not, no longer do I spend much time or, you know, so that much associated with them. But um, they do a lot of great work, uh, even uh, somewhat locally. They've done a lot of work on Año Nuevo Island. So they do all of the, done all the restoration on Año Nuevo. Um, and, um, and have a have a monitoring project that's that's associated with that restoration uh, work. Uh, they also have projects um, in Hawaii uh, looking at uh, light pollution on seabirds um, and just the uh, general productivity of seabirds in the Hawaiian Islands. And then also a big project uh, we actually it actually has a another uh, branch of it that now is official in Chile and um, they uh, do a lot of work on Isla Mocha and also on the Juan Fernandez Islands, which are which are extremely important for uh, particular species of seabirds that are pretty much endemic to those islands. And also they have an endemic um, hummingbird, the Juan Fernandez fire crown, and uh, there's a rayadito, which is a little uh, fernariad in the ovenbird family that's also uh, endemic to those to those islands. And then another organization I like a lot, quite a lot is uh, American Bird Conservancy, which is a little bit more, uh, has a little bit broader reach. Um, I think that they, they do a good job. They, uh, you know, buy up a lot of habitat. So that sort of mixture of, uh, and, and also they in, encourage a lot of um, locals, try to, trying to get locals really involved in uh, conservation efforts. Well, that's pretty important uh, in making success of anything, anything, especially I've seen some um, films of the rainforest where they get kids involved and the kids get their parents involved and all of a sudden there's a whole lot more interest in conservation. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, so one of the things that you've done with your artwork is um, do some uh, designs on utility boxes, painting utility boxes. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that project and how you chose the artwork that you did? I, I wish I could show it, but I don't have the photos of it. So I've done, let's see, I've done 
five, five utility box projects. Two I did a long time ago. So there's one and, and they basically, they end up being uh, through the uh, Santa Cruz County Parks and they send out a, um, a call for artists for them. That's how I ended up doing the, actually that's how I ended up doing all of them. Um, so the first two that I did, I did one that's uh, on um, Graham Hill Road, the, the uh, corner of Graham Hill Road and Lockhart Gulch. And then I did another one down on uh, Portola Drive. Um, but the most recent one, which I did in wow, 2019, I think the summer of 2019, where um, I had applied to do a box uh, up in Davenport that was, that's quite public, and um, I didn't I didn't get it. But instead, they offered me a bigger project was to do three uh, cell tower relay uh, boxes, but they're kind of hidden, and they really wanted them to look be sort of kind of look like the vegetation. Although I kind of I mean, I I, actually, I had a lot of fun doing them because I tried to figure out like you know put all different kinds of critters on them. I they have badgers and and um, you know local birds and everything like that, and I tried to make them so that the the vegetation would would at least had the right colors and was similar to the vegetation that was around those boxes because they wanted them they want want them to be somewhat hidden so they don't get vandalized. And so those are. So there's two that are uh, boxes that are above ground, and then there's one that's actually a vault that's been sunk into the ground. And so I painted the top of that top of that vault. So that was, they're that was, they're yeah. camouflaged. Yeah, so they're supposed to be somewhat camouflaged. And I have, I've, got, I've had a couple of friends who have come across them accidentally, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I didn't even know about those. So that's, which is kind of fun. So Yeah, that's nice. So how do they protect them from being graffitied? So they, they put some kind of anti-graffiti coating on them. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I honestly don't really know how well it works. It must work fairly well because if you drive around Santa Cruz, you see all these boxes that have been painted and, you know, you know, yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't seen any that have been graffitied. I've seen some that have sort of just gotten old and they're starting to fade or they're starting to peel slightly, but, um, whatever whatever the coating is that they put I assume it's some kind of polyurethane that that um doesn't take spray paint very really well so. Teflon or something <laughs> yeah yeah uh so moving on um when you start to draw or paint a bird how do you start that process and um where where do you go with that so in general, I don't really like painting or drawing birds that I haven't seen. And so part of part of um, the travel, all the travel that I did in Mexico was uh, to do a lot of field sketching. So I have notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of field sketches of, of birds. Um, and, and then again, because it was, you know, pre, uh, pre digital, um, I would come back home. I would have, you know, done, you know, spent three or four months just, you know, sketching birds in the field. And this is the sketching was also important again for some of those things that we could get. For, I could get from specimens for soft part colors and stuff. Much better if you can see the birds well and can, you know, write down descriptions or do a little, you know, paint paint swatch or something like that of the color, say, of the sear on a bird or the feet or something like that um, or the eye. Um, and um, so when I would come home, I would photocopy all of my field sketches and then I would glue them on sheets of paper that I could put into a notebook, so hold paper. And um, then I would put them all in taxonomic order so that I could use them for reference. And so in gen, and I still still sometimes will go back and look at those. In general, I don't, don't as much as I thought I might because the, my drawing has improved a lot since I since I you know did those because those I you know those started doing those in the in the eighties, um, but I still do a lot of drawing. So so for me whether it's now it's you know I do still do some field sketching, but I also 
you know, for reference, I will do like a, if I'm doing a, a big project, say, you know, or it's a, you know, it's a commission or a big project of some sort, I will go and look at, you know, find all the fo different photos I can and I'll do loads and loads and loads of sketches, either from the photos or if the birds are local, I'll try and go out and look at the birds uh, locally and, and try and do a lot of sketching. Um, and when I start doing, you know, I, my sketches can be, you know, they can be really fast or they can be really, really detailed. And, and um, but what I'm trying mostly to do is trying to get the feel of the bird and get the proportions right and sort of understand um, what are its most usual positions and, you know, or, and what its attitude is. And then so from there, um, then I usually do a really, you know, I'll do a really detailed drawing and then I'll, it, it kind of depends what medium I'm working in. Sometimes I'll do a really detailed drawing and I'll be painting directly on that. Sometimes it'll be a really detailed drawing. Say if it's for something like a plate, then I have many, many, many drawings and then I transfer those onto, you know, onto another sheet of paper because they all have to be in the right portion and that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then, and now, now I paint a lot more I paint a lot more now in acrylic. I used to paint almost exclusively in um, uh, watercolor and gouache, but now for my sort of more quote finished work, I tend to paint more in, in acrylic. Um, and that's usually, and I like to paint on board because I like a really smooth, smooth surface. That's just the way I like the look of a really smooth surface. So um, with that, usually I end up I end up using some kind of transfer paper or something like that to at least get the outline or the um, you know, rough position of, of where I want things placed. Right. So. So I have a few of your drawings and I'm going to open up my screen and you're going to hopefully narrate through them for us. Let's see. So, this so one, sorry, let me get, okay. let me get my thing back. There we go. So this is just a little watercolor of a Townsend warbler. This was, I did this in um, 2014, I think. So it says, so quite a while ago. And this was a year, um, which I started doing it this year again, is I decided to do a painting or a drawing every day. Uh, this year I decided I would try and do a painting every day because I found when I was just doing a drawing every day, I was getting lazy. So this is just one of the little sketches. This, I think I did this after I'd been out, out walking and this is after I'd seen a seen a Townsend's warbler some Townsend's warblers hopping around so yeah neat so this is um you know one of the our our local uh species it's this is actually a a little acrylic it's on a board it's on it's, it's quite small it's only I think it's five by seven inches of a rhinoceros ocelot uh-huh rhinoceros ocelot rhinoceros ocelot yeah and this is a little uh, started off in the field, little field painting of an Anna's hummingbird. So this is all. A lot of these are these are sketches from that. And same thing here it was. Uh, this was started in the field, watching some um, waxwings feed on elderberries. Mm -hmm. And started off as a field sketch, and then I finished it off painting it at home. Mm -hmm. And this is from actually is from the Farallons. So um, I spent mm, this is from I think 2012. I went out to the Farallons. I've been to the Farallons a bunch of times, but this time I actually went out uh, as sort of a half-time intern and half-time artist, so that I had a little extra time to go and draw. So these are some field sketches of of um, Red-breasted nuthatches that were uh, they were very very common around the lighthouse uh, at on the Farallons during um, migration. So these guys are always you know hopping around up there and looking for bugs and stuff. All right. And this is actually my backyard. So this is a little sketch that I did in my backyard here of. Uh, Pacific Wren, it probably says Winter Wren on it because I think it's quite old, what, quite old. So it was before the name was, was actually changed and it's um, underneath uh, some redwood sorrel. Nice. Not, yeah, not, 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 not giant clover. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I recognized it. <laughs> I, my dad was a, 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 a docent up at Henry Cowell, so we had to learn the plants. <laughs> some of them, anyway. Yeah, I had a friend of mine on the East Coast is like, wow, you must have some giant clover out there. And I said, no, 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 that's <laughs> That's redwood swirl, and this is again that that this, this is a, a little, little field painting that I did of some Wilson swirlers, male Wilson swirlers. They're always a, you know, calm, calm around around my house during the yeah. very Christmas. entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> super okay. cute, super cute guys. And again, I I really love wax wings, and so I have many 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 pictures of uh paintings of wax wings little little field paintings of wax wings i have a, uh, several from just a, a year or two ago i think they were one of my spark birds yeah we had an animal I, lotto game uh -huh. i always wanted to get the llama and the cedar wax wing <laughs> yeah. these are my favorites yeah, my 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 spark bird was an eastern eastern bluebird when I was at Audubon camp when I was nine. That was that was it. So again, more more Townsend warblers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in my you know and uh, spotted toeys, western spotted toeys. Mm -hmm. Common in my yard. Breed have bred once for sure in my yard and i found a nest of one in my yard neat um, yeah that's great and then these are just some birds around antonelli pond nice and western bluebird mm -hmm. and that 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 painting actually is a, a little egg tempera so that's um so that's a it's a it's small so again it's five by seven and egg tempera is it's actually egg yolk and pigment so it's a very old-fashioned uh you know kind of paint used used uh, by many of those very very detailed uh paintings that were done during the renaissance um mm -hmm. were done and done in egg tempera so it's very it has some of the same translucent qualities that uh, watercolors have so it has can have really beautiful colors to it, but it's a little fiddly to it's a little fiddly to work with. So does it yeah. dry quickly? No, it doesn't dry particularly quickly. It dries more quickly, say, than oil paint does, but it doesn't. It and it, yeah, it was just a little. It was just difficult. A little difficult to work with. It was just why this is so painted with like tons and tons of little teeny tiny lines. Oh, I see. Yeah. And this is just a field sketch of um, some lesser gold finches that were there's a, a big, big huge on the one of the places where I where I walk my dogs there's a big huge huge patch of rosemary and I just like the I like they love they love hopping around in it I like the little purple flowers and the and the birds combination yellow bird yeah well. That's a, let's see if I can get, I'm gonna pop back to you and continue with some, a few more questions. Um, that was a nice little vacation there to get out bird watching while I'm sitting at my desk. There you go. So, so I wanna kinda ask you a couple of things about uh, this last year. You know, it was kind of a scary experience being involved in the being evacuated when there were wildfires. Um, we had a huge fire here in Santa Cruz called the Lightning Complex Fire, and a thousand homes were lost in that, or buildings were lost in that uh, fire. But your home survived. But while you were evacuated, it was broken into. And now you're facing potential mudslides. I just want to know, are you, are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing fine. I mean, I, you know, after the fire, I thought a lot about, um, you know, what, what things were important to me and stuff. So I've actually, I've rented a storage unit and I have, 
moved out most of my artwork, not all of it. I mean, I still have some, uh, you know, a few things in my living room, but basically I moved out all my artwork and I had a lot of, uh, you know, I'd like to obviously had a lot of artwork of my mother's, um, some of my brother's and some of friends of my parents and my parents collected a lot of odds and ends. And so all of that stuff is now all in um, a storage unit. And I mean, it's just kind of, I mean, everybody right now is, you know, with the pandemic and everything, it's, I think everybody's just a little sort of uncertain. So I just sort of feel like right now my, I, my, I feel like my life is like a little bit on hold in a funny way. Um, and I, um, you know, I, I feel like I have friends who, and, and, and both of my brothers have been incredibly productive during this, this whole time. I feel like I have not been. I mean, the one thing I have been productive about is making sure that I really train my younger dog. <laughs> you know? um, but I haven't been as productive art wise as I, you know, I might imagine I, I uh, would be. I mean, I do draw probably just about every day. So I have like loads of, you know, notebooks full of, you know, of sketches and stuff, but I haven't, I feel like some people used it as an opportunity to like figure out some big project to really focus on. And I definitely have not done that. So, so that's the one part of that, that, that I think, I think that I still feel really at some level, really unsettled, you know, I mean, I'm doing fine and, you know, I'm fine financially. I'm lucky. I have my house. I know I have wh where I live is probably the least likely place at the moment for there to be a debris flow, even though it is, it is in the middle of the purple area on one of the maps, but I don't think it's a very likely place. So particularly so far, how the rain has been, it's actually been very good. You know, we haven't had any like sustained three days of, you know, pouring, pouring rain. It's like it rained hard today, but it only rained hard today for two hours, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's supposed to, you know, be dry for a little bit and then it's supposed to rain again on Friday. So I feel like I may be raining again a little bit on Wednesday too, but I feel like so I'm I'm feeling you know sort sort of okay although today I did start packing up a few more things to take over to my storage unit so so when when you heard about the fires and the evacuation how much time did you have to get stuff together and and pack your things so I actually left I left earlier than um, some people did so I left the afternoon that we had the full evacuation so I really didn't want it with having two dogs um, I really didn't want to and and also I decided to go and stay with with friends who I know but don't know really well in San Jose and I decided that I wanted to get didn't want to like I have you know have to wake them up at like three or four in the morning or something like that and um, so I had like a you know like you know, part of a day to get stuff together. I re in retrospect, I didn't get there. Like w when I packed up to put stuff in my storage unit, I realized that there were some things that I would have been really, really upset if I lost them that um, I hadn't packed. Um, like there was a whole box full of old journals that I thought I had packed, but I hadn't had. Um, and those are the things that are important to me. Like I can always paint something again, but it's that old stuff, the old stuff that I, um, that I would be really sad, you know, stuff from the, you know, from the eighties that I would be sad to lose. Not, you know, it's all, it's all nostalgic. It's probably not stuff that I'm ever really going to use, but it still has a lot of nostalgic value for me. So, um, yeah, so I was, you know, and, and I, you know, and I left, I left at like four in the afternoon and the evacuation order, Came. So I, I left during the pre-evacuation order and then the evacuation order came at two in the morning or something like that, that night. So. Yeah. yeah, we have friends that didn't get any warning at all. They had five minutes to get out and they lost their house up on Last Chance Road. So I, it's, it's just scary even thinking about it. But, you know, I'm glad you're okay and and uh, another thing I wanted to ask you is, since the fires, have you noticed any unusual species of birds around your house? I have not. 
Um, I know other people have, but I haven't. I mean, everything seems to me seems pretty normal. But, you know, I live next to Fall Creek State Park. And part of Fall Creek State Park got burned, but they didn't you know they were able to stop it in the in fall in, in the park. And I mean a lot of the park is still okay. So I have a feeling that there's not as much pressure as there might be in people as there might be where people who live right next to, you know, parts of Bonnie Dune and stuff that burned really, uh, really, really severely. So I think like there's still there's still a lot of habitat around me and there's still a lot of um you know, the, yeah, I just, yeah, I, have, I, have, I haven't noticed any, any big change. All right. Well, it's been so nice spending the afternoon with you chatting. And uh, I just want to say if anybody wants to see more of Sophie's work, they can visit her website at sophieweb.com. And so we'll be looking forward to uh, going out birding with you in the future here. Very good. Thank you, Sandy. It's been fun. All right. Take care. Say, say goodbye, Daya. Say goodbye.